So I'm here to introduce Gary Koscielny. Gary began playing in 2014, became enthralled with the game, and has become a regular on the tournament circuit. In 2022, he won the Boston Open and was a finalist in the New York Masters. He has attained the ranking of Master M3 from the BMAB and is a teaching pro with the Backgammon Learning Center. Today, he will be talking to us about the basic tools essential to making proper cube decisions in racing games. He will also point to areas to explore in order to reach a more advanced level. I welcome Gary. Thank you, Antoinette. Let me uh, share the screen. Okay, can you see the, uh, everyone see the PowerPoint? Or not the PowerPoint, but the PDF? Yeah, we can see it, Chris, just Okay, great. good. So um, welcome everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, the Cube, uh, because usually people don't like to talk about it, and it's one of the more difficult aspects of the game um, for everyone, uh, if you compare PR, performance rating, uh, of the top level people and or anybody for that matter it's usually their their q play is usually worse than their checker play um, um and and the reason for that is it's more difficult <laughs> it's harder to see intuitively uh what's what's going to happen and what the right uh, moves are um so i thought i would start with some the, the simplest uh uh forms of, of, of games to cube which are the races uh, and that race is simply where you have more, no contact or very little contact. Uh, so uh, the other aspect of the cube, and I've got the little guy there with his, uh, the, the cowboy with his, uh, uh, those are actually cubes on the side, not guns. So he's, he's ready to throw the cube. Uh, and the cube is a weapon. Um, and it can be a very effective weapon uh, if you know how to use it. Um, and, and for a couple of reasons, um, one is it, it forces your opponent to make a decision that that uh, she may not be prepared to make or not have any idea what to do with it, and so could likely make the wrong decision. And second, uh, it doubles the value of the game, and uh, you're going to want to throw the cube when you are uh, more likely to win, and you'll get two points instead of one. Uh, most racing games aren't gamish, and that's a whole separate topic, so we're not going to talk about that. But um, um, and also, uh, you know, when you throw the cube, uh, you're you should be uh, have the advantage, of course, but you can also just win the game. Your advantage may be 90 to 10 or so 90 percent of the time you're going to win. But um, uh, I'm sure you've if you've played long enough, you've uh, probably been in a situation on either side where your chances of winning were, were you know, 95 percent and you lost. Uh, that just happened to me the other day. I was 96% to win, and uh, my opponent threw a couple of double sixes, a double fives, and all of a sudden uh, I went from 96 to zero. Uh, that's not good. So uh, let's get started on that. Um, and what I have, I prepared this. Uh, it's now in a PDF. It was a PowerPoint, but uh, and that I'll use mostly as a reference, and I will send it. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to April or Antoinette or whoever wants to forward it on to anyone who's interested in it. It's got a lot more information than we'll go. We'll be able to go over. Um, I've started. Do, I've covered some really basic things, and there are some things that are are kind of more intermediate level, and there's some things that are more advanced level, which uh, I, we're not going to get to the advanced level stuff, and hopefully we'll get to some of the intermediate level stuff, but. Uh, it would depend on on uh, questions and things like that. And please uh, feel free to interrupt if you if I'm not clear on something or you have a question or want to uh, uh, ask about something related. Go ahead and interrupt, and uh, we can talk about that. Uh, uh, I'm, it's much better for me to know that people are are paying attention, and if I missed something, didn't explain something well, that I can go back and correct that. So, so uh, here are the contents. We'll get into. A, we'll talk about long races. Those are fairly simple, and and we have what I would what I seem what what I believe is the most precise tool in backgammon for determining what the proper decision is. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll show that to you and we'll look at a few positions uh, with cover that. Uh, then uh, something that a, a lot of people have trouble with or don't know that they should do is, is how to count. So I will give you one method for counting, but I think it's the simplest method and I'll go over it briefly. Um, and, and, and that will give you an idea. And then the, the, it's written out in, the, in this PowerPoint uh, and you can practice it if you want. You, mu you must practice it. If you're gonna use it, you have to practice it. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, I'll show you a, a, a technique to remember how to count, uh, to remember the count, because if you're playing over the board in a live tournament, uh, you can count your own checkers and then you count your opponent's checkers and then you forget what your own count was. Um, and everyone does that. I've done that. Uh, but here I'm going to show you a method where you uh, can remember this, um, can remember the one, the first count that you did. Uh, and that's uh, very helpful. Otherwise you got to keep counting and you may forget the second time too. Um, uh, there's something in races, uh, races aren't just necessarily about the pip count. There, uh, there are certain, um, Situations where you have what's called wastage, where the pip count really isn't representative of, of the, the race. So uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then if we get to it, uh, we'll talk about, uh, but there's a formula for long races. Uh, there's a formula for medium size or shorter races. And then once you get down to uh, down toward the end, very short races, you're just counting the number of rolls that you're going to take to get off. And so we'll talk about that if we, well, if we get to that. Uh, finally, and the most advanced part of this is adjustment for match score, which I don't think we'll get to. Um, and those are a little bit trickier and require a lot more, more study. So uh, the first technique, well, and before I do that, let's go uh, to a position here. And so I just, uh, a question, uh, I'll put it on the screen already. So hopefully no one saw that. Uh, is this, I'll change it so that this may, may make a difference. So say you're in this position, position and we are uh, yellow or, or white on the bottom and uh, uh, we're bearing off. And so this is, this is a pure race. There's no contact uh, left. And so the question is, you know, is this a double? Um, and is, if it is a double, is it a take? So take a look at that, and uh, I'll give you a few uh, a few seconds, and someone can venture a guess. And uh, and if you want to explain how you came up with that, that would that would be helpful too. Dina, what do you think? I'm not so sure. Gail, Gail, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think it's. A, uh, I assume it's yellow. Yellow's turn. Yes, yeah, yellow's on roll. Yes, yeah, yellow's on roll. Um, yeah, I think it's a double. I think it's a double because um, there's our opponent has two blanks on twenty three and twenty four. We have one. We have three to get in. He has four to get in. Uh, I mean, it's marginal. He could throw doubles twice and, you know, we'll lose. But I think that it's worth the risk. Karen Doobie. Oh, uh, and, and, and is it a take? Uh, whenever, you're, whenever we talk about doubling in this situation, we also should talk about whether we're going to take if we're on the other side. Um, that way you can kind of learn both yeah. sides at once. Yeah. Um, I think it depends what the score is. Um, I mean, if he's really behind. Yeah, we're going to look for this. We're going to look at um, just like money games or chouette or something where that where there's no score. It's this is just okay. one game. Okay. I think um, I would double and probably is not a take. Okay, and, and why? Um, there's a count advantage to doubling. Mm -hmm. And for the same reason, um, 
uh, Gail mentioned that there's more deficit on the inner board on on, on dark side, mm -hmm. and they have a little bit further to go to get in. So, um, and if it was a match point game, maybe that would be different. If I was two or three behind, I might take. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're if you're farther behind, you're more likely to take in a match. Yeah, um, if I'm far enough behind that the wind doesn't matter. I mean, if, if the wind if the wind terminates the match, then I might as well take it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a double and it's a bear take, but it is a take. I agree with Leslie. It's a double and a take. Yeah. yeah I use I, the ten percent plus out, two. I, I agree with the bear take as well. Yeah. I use the 10 plus 10 percent plus two, and I think that um, that black is within that window mm -hmm. to take. OK, good. Well, the 10 percent plus two is what I'm going to teach you. So uh, <laughs> thank you, April, for saying that. I'm glad glad someone knows that already. That's good. So, yeah, uh, a lot of good things were mentioned here. Um, some things matter more than the other. The, the main thing is the race, which is based on the pip count here. So uh, yellow is up 75, is head by nine, 75 to 84. So, and, and yellow is on roll. And so we're always gonna be looking uh, today and generally when we look at things, if we're considering a cube, we're on roll. Uh, because obviously we can't cube if we're not on roll. Just if for those of you not familiar with XG, uh, the dice over here tell you who's on roll. So if they're, they're yellow here, so uh, yellow's on roll. If we switch it, now they're black, oh, wow. and so blacks are brown. The browns on roll. So, uh, but generally, we're always going to take it from the position of of, of yellow um, at at the bottom of the screen. So, uh, the formula that we use and and uh, it, races are funny in that there's what's called a doubling window, uh, and the and and the window is only three pips long. So what the doubling window means is that the window opens uh, at a certain point, and that's the point at which you should double um, and, and, and which your opponent would take. And then there's three pips uh, difference is the what's called the point of last take, and that's the point which you should double, but that's the last point at which you, the, uh, re, your opponent should take. Um, and it's only three pips long. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's 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 very accurate uh, in, in terms of the proper move to make. So, okay. So, how do we do this now? All right, we're, we know we're ahead in the race. Uh, a number of you have mentioned things like the open spaces here, and um, uh, what 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 basically factors into a distribution is how the checkers di are distributed, and so that's going to be very important. Um, however, uh, what was mentioned is not that critical. So the fact that these two points are open uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't, it's not gonna affect our decision. Now, if we had a stack here, okay, that would affect our decision uh, because uh, when we look at the pip count, um, we know that when we get to the point of taking off these checkers, we're probably not gonna take them off with just a one. We're probably going to take them off with the four or five or something like that or three. Um, and when we do that, we're we're wasting pips, so to speak. Um, and so when we have checkers, a stack of checkers on the ace or the deuce point, we're going to talk. We're going to have to make some adjustments to our count. Uh, and those are and we, I'll, I'll, well, if we get to it, we'll talk about the, the Keith count adjustments. There are various ways to to do adjustments for these. Um, and when, I'll teach you one. Uh, the one that I use, and it's that's pretty easy and, and pretty good. Okay, so uh, uh, but the main thing here with this, uh, we should look at this and say the distribution is pretty good, um, and so this is all pretty much about the pip count. And so, okay, what do we do? Uh, how do we determine from the pip count what's the proper decision? What's the proper decision going to be? And so uh, April mentioned the ten percent plus two, and uh, uh, the ten percent plus two simply means you're going to take the person on roll, the person who's considering doubling, and his tip count is seventy-five, 
and we're going to take 10% of that, which is seven. We're not going to round up or down. We're just going to take seven. Um, and then we're going to add two, and that's nine. Uh, and then we're going to add that to our pip count, the 75, so we get up to 84. And that's called the point of last take. That's when the doubling window closes. So, and point of last take is is what it means. It's it's the last. It's the point at which the opponent should take the cube. And if it's one pip, uh, if uh, yellow has a one pip advantage, then the, the opponent should drop um, the cube. Uh, and this is fairly accurate. So let's look at what XG says. And XG says yes, it's a double and a take. Um, and so that's uh, so that's the correct answer. Uh, some other things uh, just to point out, and, and I think some people get uh, confused about this because it's not intuitive at all, is uh, black has only a 22.5% chance to win here. Um, and yet it's still a take. Most people say, oh, I got 22. Why would I take it? Um, and so, you know, the answer is that, well, this is about the point at which uh, your 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 chances of, uh, well, your expected value is about the same whether you take or whether you drop. What do I mean by expected value? Well, if uh, you take and lose, you're going to lose two. Um, uh, and that's going to happen 77% of the time. If you take, however, and you roll the double sixes or the big big numbers, uh, you're going to win two. And that's going to happen about 25% of the time, more or less. And so uh, if you, you know, if you, if you lose two at 75 and win two at 25, that's about the same as, as just dropping uh, immediately. So if you drop, you automatically lose one. So in any case, we're looking at roughly 22, 22 to 25% is, is uh, your, your minimum take point, your minimum uh, winning chances that you want to have uh, and to, to still take the, uh, uh, the game. Um, okay. And keep in mind, too, uh, um, one of the things, if you're on, if you're on the cube side of the thing, you want to throw the cube is you want to double when your opponent is going to take the cube. Um, because if you double when after you've, you know, at, at when it drops, you'll get one point. Okay, great. You win. That's better than losing. Um, uh, but you would rather win two. So you want to, you know, the proper cube decision is, is to take the, uh, is to throw the cube, you know, at the last point. Uh, at, the, at the exact point at which your your uh, opponent will drop, or, I'm sorry, will take, uh, in order to get, you know, in order to win two instead of one. So okay, so let's look at the doubling window here. Now uh, we're at the point of last take right now, uh, and so Black should take this. It's a point oh four error if he doesn't. If we put, if we give Yellow an an extra pip, uh, let's do this one. Okay. Now it's a drop. And these are very close. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I say these, this is most accurate is that you know, I don't know of anything else in backhand and any rule, any tool that you can use that um, you know, gets you within one pip of being right. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is almost always right within one, one pip. You know, sometimes it's a pip off and, and you know, if you follow the uh, the method you'll make a small error, but uh, uh, but that's that's pretty good. Um, any other method that that I've learned about, particularly with respect to the cube, uh, there's a lot of well kind of fuzziness where you sort of looks and thinks and you think it's right, but you know you can't really be sure. And if you adjusted by one pip, it probably wouldn't make any difference in what you were thinking. Um, here it it's all comes down to you know pretty much math. Okay, so. Uh, now the the doubling window is three pips. What that means is that, uh, and we're right at the window here. If we move a checker back three pips, uh, this should still be a double and a take. Well, obviously it's a take, um, and, and it's barely a double here. Uh, so, uh, and if we move move another pip back, now this is too early to double, and it's a no double. And again, these are very close, and sometimes they'll beat off by a pip or so. But uh, you know, it's 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 always amazing to me how accurate this is. 
Um, yeah. uh, and it applies to, you know, uh, we just scatter the checkers around again. We're at 80, so. Okay, so let's just practice uh, this one again. Um, and what do, we, what do we think? Given the 10% the plus two rule, try to use the 10% plus two rule and then the, the window uh, and try, let's come up, uh, see if we can come up with it, whether this is a double in a take or not. It's a double. Okay, so, so Gary, much is a double. I have a question. You yeah. were you were to get to your doubling window, you are subtracting three pips yeah. from the point of last take. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Okay. So in this case, it would be the point of last take would be 10. And then if you subtract three, it would be seven. Um and there's eight pips. Um, 97. Yeah, so it looks like. Looks like a double to me. Double and take or pass. Uh, a take. Yeah. Easy take. Yeah. And so that, yes, yeah, so that's exactly how you do this. Um, you look at your score 89. We're going to take 10%. That's eight. We're going to add two, that's 10. So if we're 10 peps ahead, uh, that's the point of last take. So uh, you can now, it's easy if you're looking at a screen, if you're playing on uh, online where they'll give you the pip count, um, you know, you can see it right there and you're, you're eight ahead. You need to be 10 ahead is the point of last take. So this is going to be a take for black and the, the doubling amount is uh, three pips earlier. So it's uh, seven <laughs> and we're, uh, eight ahead and seven, so this should be a double and a take. Um, uh, what I usually like to do is, is take to, in order to not hold so many things in my head to say, okay, I've got 89. My the point of last take is going to be 10% plus two is, you know, 10 more, so 99. Uh, if my opponent has 99, uh, more than 99 is passed. He's got 97. Okay, so I take 99. I subtract three, 96. He's got 97. Double and a take. Um, okay. Gary, I want to yeah. ask. I want to ask uh, some of the the other listeners here. Are you understanding what he's explaining here? If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We're all learning here. Any questions? How do you count so fast? I mean, I I follow it, but I just you know. Yeah. yeah okay. Well. Um, uh, I can. Do, well, I mean, like I got the yellow count, and then by the you know, then I have to go across yeah, the board well, the, and start counting yeah, there. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm looking at the number, the pip counts here at the bottom right. See where my cursor is, and the upper right. Yeah. So I'm not counting the pips in you know for this example. I'm just using the the numbers oh. here. So they're oh, already okay. there. If you were trying to count pips, yeah, it yeah. would take it would take longer to do that. Um, so uh, the way now the way that I learned, I I can do this fairly quickly in my head because I've been doing it a long time. But the way that I practiced this was to uh, play online generally, uh, and and then have a sheet of paper uh, and say, okay, my pip count is eighty nine. Uh, then I would do the math. 10% of that is 8 plus 2 is 10, and then add it out. And then I would compute the window, which is, in this case, it's uh, you know 99 to 96, and write that down, and then I'd compare it. Now, once you practice that enough, uh, then you can do it in your head. Um, and, uh, you know, this is – and you can do it in your head. I mean, I, uh, one of the things you come up with is that – you know, as a lot of people don't like to do math, uh, and this is math, and it, it's tedious. And uh, 
but you can do it. Uh, you, you, you need to practice it. I, I, you know, I would always start online with the numbers here. Uh, if you get into a live match, you know, you have to do the counts and, uh, but that's when you need to do it in your head because you can't have a piece of paper there to write it in. So you, you have to have practice beforehand for it to work. Uh, so that's how I would learn it and I would practice it. And, um, you know, if you practice it enough, it becomes second nature. Um, and, you know, as I said, this is the most accurate tool in backgammon that I know of. Uh, so it's really nice to have it, uh, you know, to be able to do it. May I ask something or say something? In this particular position, I look at it and I see that yellow is at least a roll ahead. He has better distribution inside and he's a roll ahead on the outside. I yeah. Mean, that's without counting. That's without doing any yeah. of the math. Well, that's all true. But, you know, you could have the same. You know, this, the, what your statement is also true over here. You know, the distribution is good, it's, it's better and it, you know, but this, but he, this is a pass and the other one was, was a take. I think. So it's, you really need to know the count because this, um, you know, a lot of people try to look at this kind of holistically or visually and, 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 but uh, given that, you know, the window is three pips long, um, it's very hard to, to judge that just by looking at the board without, you know, without doing the count. Okay. So uh, you really need to do the count uh, to be accurate. Um, okay. Now, obviously, you know, we can, you can just play for fun and, and say, well, it look like, looks like we're ahead and, and make it that way. But, you know, if you, if you'd really rather win the game, <laughs> it's, it's nice to count and nice to have the count. Okay. So, yeah, again, I, the way that I would, the way that I learned this was to, have a piece of paper and and do the math on paper uh, while I'm playing, you know, online, uh, you know, not not if you're in a tournament, that would be cheating. But but, you know, online, if you're you know playing for fun, uh, you know, do that, do it that way until it becomes automatic uh, and then you can do it because you do have to if you're going to play live, you do have to do it in your head because uh, they don't allow a piece of paper. Well, unless you agree to have let everyone use piece of paper to add the count. But. Uh, at, at a regular tournament, you can't do that. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Let me. Uh, uh, so he, he, you know, here's the explanation uh, for this long race, and and the basic the formula is uh, there's a doubling window. Uh, you determine your adjusted pip count. In this, in the examples that we looked at, there were no adjustments. Uh, we then turn we turn the leaders count, which is usually us. Uh, or it would be our opponent if our opponent is going, is doubling us. The trailers pip count, uh, uh, we, and then we look at the doubling window. Uh, so 10% plus two is the point of last take. That's when the window closes. And another way of thinking about it is ten, and three pips earlier is 10% minus one. Uh, that's when the window opens. Um, uh, so that's basically it. And, and you, if you practice that, you'll you'll get it right. Uh, you'll be as good as the experts uh, at that long races uh, using this. Okay. Uh, all right, here was the example, which we just looked at on XG. Which, okay, so, um, which sort of gets us to the question of, okay, how do you count? Okay, it's easy if we're looking at XG, we um, count, uh, we can, we can, you know, they, they show you the pip count. Uh, but, you know, if you're playing live, no one's going to show you the pip count. Uh, and so you have to count yourself. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's actually really annoying <laughs> to have to count because you spend a lot of time doing it. And I, you know, during the pandemic, we were all playing online and uh, we, you know, I didn't play in person for two years. And so when I started playing back in person again, uh, I had to train my mind again to count, uh, which is, you know, not fun. You'd much rather roll dice and, and make decisions and things like that, but you have to do it. And it takes practice. So what's the simplest way uh, that I found to, to count? Um, oh, and I would say if you're already using a different count and you're happy with it, keep using it. Uh, it's better to, to, uh, from my perspective, to use one method, know how to do it, feel comfortable with it, be accurate with it, uh, practice it up until you can be fast. 
and, and do that. If you don't have a method yet, then I would use this one. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain it quickly and then I'll go over the board and, and show you how it works. Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll leave it to you to practice it because I can talk to my blue in the face, but uh, about how to do it and what to do, but you have to practice it if you want to use it. Uh, and that's going to be true of any, of any county method that you have. Um, so uh, what we do, the easiest way that I've seen and, and have taught people to use is basically you're going to go through all your points and you're going to add up the PIP value, which is the, you know, the marker value. I'll show you what that is on XG for all the points uh, with, with two checkers. And if you have four checkers on a spot, you're going to, you're going to use double, double it, double the, the count. Uh, so you're going to go that for the first round and add up all those counts. Uh, and then on the second round, you're going to go and add up all the, uh, add on all the uh, pips, pip uh, markers for the ones that have odd numbers, that have a, a lone checker or a third checker, or in some cases, a fifth checker, if that's the case. And that gives you the count. Um, so what did I mean by that? Um, here, this is, now this is pretty easy because they're all two. So what I would do here is, um, I, you know, I'd go through the count. So this is three, I'd say th uh, three. Oh, I forgot to, well, I'll, I'll show you stuff. I, I think I forgot to mention before. So I go three plus four is seven, five is 12, six is 18. Uh, seven is 25, eight is uh, 33. Okay. So I've, now I've counted all the check, all the spots with two checkers on them so, and come up with 33. So then I'm going to multiply that by two because I had two checkers on each. So that's 66. Then I'm going to start over and say 66 plus two is 68, plus seven is 75, plus nine is 84. Okay. 84 is the pip count. Okay. So um, uh, now there are other ways of doing that, uh, of doing the count. Um, none of them, I think, are as simple as this. I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I, it's simpler, I think, because it's easy to add the numbers uh, up. You're not adding anything difficult. You're not, you, you know, you're not carrying anything by. Well, I guess if you get if you have checkers on the other side. It becomes a little more difficult, but but it's still it's the simplest way. Um, and you know I don't want to spend a lot of time. Oh, let me I'll do another example. Let's say we have five checkers here. How would I do that? Okay, well I'd start with four plus five is nine. Now six we have four on on here, so I'm going to yeah. count twice. So nine plus six is fifteen. Plus another six is twenty one. Uh, plus seven is 28, plus eight is 36. I'm going to multiply that by two, that's 72. One here is 74, six is uh, 80, and nine is 89. And so you come up with 89. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of simple math, uh, but really I came to that 89 pretty quickly. Uh, you know, if you, if you sit around and... You know, watch people try to count pips. Uh, that's probably about as fast as you can get uh, to to come up with, you know, to come up with this number. And it's also because the math none of the, none of the math involved is that is all that difficult. Uh, it's usually pretty accurate. The other problem you you know you have with counting pips is if you uh, and um, it's easy to do this is is you know you you miscount something or, or you're not sure or it doesn't look right and then you start over and try it again. Uh, and, and, you know, miscounting the PIP, doing miscounting, like Thanks. when I get it wrong, it's usually because I forgot to carry a number and I was, I'm off by 10. And so if you're off by 10 here, uh, that's a big mistake. Um, so, you know, if you if you came up with 99 for your PIP count versus 97, you know, you're not going to double here and it's a big error not to double here. Um, so, again, uh, simple method, practice it a lot. Uh, and you'll get it. You'll get it down. Um, okay. Any questions on that? I don't want to talk about it too much, but um, it, the idea is clear, and you, it, it's easy. It's fairly easy to practice. 
uh, and you can just pull out the, you know, hope, hopefully you all have XG or something like it where it will give you the count and you can check it right away. Um, okay. So uh, now that we can count, how do you remember the count? Good question. Uh, because, you know, you count, you know, you start here, you count 89, and then you start doing the other side. You do the same thing on the other side. And so, you know, there's a lot of little math, you know, adding, you know, threes and fours and fives and doubling and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you come up with 97. And then, you know, what was what was the first count? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've forgotten that a number of times. I have to count that one again. So the way that, uh, and I'll give credit, uh, Phil Simborg taught this one to me. Uh, so I'll give Phil credit for that. Uh, is that, um, well, I think it's better to look on the board. So, so suppose we have 89. We've come up with 89. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put one finger here on the eight. Okay, and then I'm going to put another finger on the nine. So now I know that I've got 89. Now, um, the, the, fault, the, the drawback here is, is, is that if you put your fingers in, you can't remember whether it's 89 or 98. <laughs> so that's the tricky part. Uh, but uh, that's better than trying to remember the whole number to begin with. You know, usually if you have a piece of it and you remember it's 89, you can remember long enough that you have two fingers there, whether it's 89 or 98. Uh, and if you don't have your fingers there, you don't, you're much more likely to forget it. So, so then I do 89. I keep my fingers there. If you ever come watch me in a match and I'm counting, I've got my fingers someplace. That means I've counted my side um, and I have my fingers there. Uh, and then I count the other side. Okay. Um, and, and you don't use fingers for that because I don't even want to think about that. Uh, now, so what if you get, what if you're, you know, what if you're at like 105 or something like that? Well, I'm going to put my finger, one finger on the 10 and another finger on the five. Uh, if it's 115, I'm going to put a finger on 11 and then a finger on the five. Uh, and if it's, you know, 126, it's finger on the 12 and a finger on the six. If you get into 130s, I put my finger over here in the tray. Um, and then, and then the other number, if I, if it's, you know, 120, even I put my finger on the 12 and my other finger on the other tray. Okay, that's cool. Um, if I'm over 130, uh, then I'm usually in trouble and, uh, <laughs> I will, I don't know. Uh, I'll try to remember it. I, I, I may put my finger on the outside for 140. I guess it doesn't happen. Usually if you're that, if, if you're that high up in, in the count, uh, usually you're not thinking about racing. Usually you don't have a race and, they, and, and usually it's more a question of, well, are you ahead or behind in the race? And, uh, and so it's, that's, it, it doesn't make, you know, you don't have to be that accurate. Um, so in any case, that's how I do that. Uh, that, uh, is one of the more useful things that I've learned. Um, it's very simple, but you know, if you're, if you're playing live, uh, you need to keep track of the count. Uh, you know, you, you went all the, to, to all the trouble to count the pips, uh, you might as well remember them so that you can use them when you determine what you want to do. So, uh, that's a really good method. All right. Next topic is, ah, the Keith count. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we've talked about this. And, and some people mentioned that the distribution is important. Uh, they mentioned gaps. Uh, gaps are important. Um, and so uh, let's talk about how we adjust uh, with the Keith count. Uh, now, Keith, there's, there's a backgammon player named Keith. I don't know what his first name was. Uh, and uh, from what my understanding was, he was just kind of playing around with uh, – uh, XG or whatever the equivalent was when he was doing it and, and trying to figure out, you know, how much, uh, the, uh, a good method for the distribution, uh, for, for adjustments to the distribution, um, came up with this. So he sort of did this by trial and error. Uh, there are other methods, uh, other adjustment methods that I've seen, um, uh, uh some are, most of them seem to be a bit more complicated. Uh, this is very, um, 
very mechanical. Uh, you, you learn it and then you can just do it uh, right away and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to wonder about too many things. And it's, it's, it's fairly accurate. Uh, there are occasionally um, uh, times where, where certain things are, the adjustment isn't quite right. So it's not as accurate as say the 10 plus, 10 percent plus two rule is, but it will give you uh, a much better um, uh, feel uh, and a much better adjustment for uh, funny distributions than you can by just looking at it. Uh, because basically, you know, essentially, there are times when the pip count is a good measure of how how soon you're going to get off, but it's not always a good measure if the distribution isn't isn't right, is, is, is uneven. So let's take a look at our adjustments for it here. And they're listed here. Again, this is another thing that uh, you need to practice. And the way that I practice to, to learn this is is the same way to, when I, when applying the formulas is that I would look at a position uh, and I'd write down the pip count and then I'd go through uh, item by item uh, all the adjustments that I needed to make and then write down the final, what I call the Keith count. So you have the pip, pip count uh, and then you have the adjustments and then you have the Keith count. And so when we're actually, when we're actually doing the 10% plus two rule, uh, we're gonna apply that to Keith counts. Um, now, in the first example I gave, it didn't matter because I didn't want to go into the, at that time. The, the Keith count was the pip count. Um, but now we're going to look at adjustments that you want to make. Okay. So they're listed here. We'll go through them uh, over the board in a minute. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and the wording here is a little bit uh, uh, tricky, but it's tried to be, try to keep it short. It's easier to see visually, but I'll, I'll read it through anyway. So, uh, you're going to, for every checker, you have more than one checker on the ace point, you're going to add two pips. So if you have two checkers on the ace point, you're going to add, uh, you're going to do a, a, a two pip, pip adjustment to your pip count. Uh, every checker more than one on the deuce point, you're going to add one pip. So if you have two checkers on the deuce point, you're going to add one pip. Uh, if you have, for every checker more than three, on the three point, you're going to add one pip. Um, and uh, if you uh, if you have an empty four, five, or six point, you're also going to add one pip for that empty point. Uh, if you, and if you have an empty five and a six, you add two two pips. So it's one one pip for each empty point. Um, one thing, uh, and then I added e one. Um, this, that wasn't in the Keith count that, that I learned originally. I don't think it, uh, well, XG will do the Keith count for you. I'll show you how they do that, uh, where you can find that. But I don't I don't think this is in the XG uh, Keith count. Is that if, if one uh, player has more checkers off than the other, then uh, the one that's behind has fewer checkers off. I usually give them one extra pip for every checker difference. So, if, you know, if, if my opponent has a checker off and I don't, I'm going to add one to my pip count for that checker. Okay. All right. So what does all that mean? That was a lot to remember. Um, uh, so let's look at And let's keep black even. 50, 53, 54, 55, 56, 70, 59, 60, 61, 61. Okay, so I hear some people doing the adjustments, and uh, which is good. So let's see what, what the adjustments are. And how to do them. So we're going to start with 56. That's the that's the count. So we've already counted and come up with 56. Now the way you do this is you start as you start at the ace point and go on and see what adjustments you need to make. So we have three checkers on the ace point. Uh, who remembers the adjustment for that? Two. It's two. Two pips per what? It's four, so it's two per pips checker. 
checker more than one. That's right. Yeah. So it's two pips for each checker more than one. We've got three. And so that means there are two checkers more than one. So we're going to add four. Um, so all right, we're going to add four to our pip count to get the Keith count. So we're already up to 60. Now, on the deuce point, adjustment there? No. Okay. No, only one checker. You only adjust if you have two or more. Uh, the three point? One. One? Yes. Zero. Uh, yeah, no, it's zero. It's, it's for uh, more than three. Oh, uh, more than three. So we only have two, so there's no adjustment for that. If you had four checkers, you'd you'd add a pip. Add, add a yeah, add a pip for the pip count. Um, uh, okay, four. No adjustment there. It's not it's not open. Same with five and six, no adjustment there. So uh, the count uh, we have is 60. 56 plus four. So our count is 60. Uh, our opponent's count is 61. Um, what does that tell us? Well, well so what I mean by that is, is this a double, a, a take, or a pass? Um, well, if we are at 60 and we apply the 10% uh, plus two rule, that's 66 and two is 68. 68 is the point of last take. Our opponent has 61. And that means we're not within the doubling window. It should be uh, no double. And it is. Uh, the reason, uh, well, we're below the, uh, the problem is that when you get below 62, we use a slightly different rule. And so let's put it above 62 so that we're not there. Let's see, I didn't get there yet. Oh, I know. Okay, so we're at 61 now. I need to do a little bit more here. 63, we're gonna add four to 67. That should work. And so this should be a no double, right? So 63 plus four is 67. Our opponent has 67. The, the, the range uh, should be 10% plus two is 75 to 74. I'm sorry, 75 to 72. It should be the double. Now, if we put a checker out here, this should be close it's no double it's close so we're actually off here by a pip two pips this is a double so you know again the keith count the adjustments aren't as you know it's not as accurate if you have to use these adjustments but they you know they give you the idea um, um okay let's look at another example And I'll take this one. Actually, let's make it longer. Well, wow. we're going to run into this, this same problem again, but. I know, let's put them all the same. Okay, so we have a pip count of 59. Uh, and let's go through the adjustments again. On the ace point, we have two. So we're going to penalize ourselves how much? Two. Two. So we're up to 61. Uh, deuce point, we have two. What's the uh, what's the adjustment for that? One. 
one. So we're up to uh, 62 now. Uh, nothing for three, because we have three or fewer. Nothing for four, it's not open. Uh, five point one is open, so one, uh, and that's it. Um, so one pip, two pips, two more is four, we're up to 63. Uh, okay, our opponent now starts with 64, but he has the same adjustments, two, three, four. So he's up to 68. So if you look at that, um, 64 uh, and 10% plus two is eight, 72, we're down to 69. This is actually not as close as it should be. Well, you know, you know, the problem is we're running into the, we're getting into a shorter race. Um, generally, when you have a shorter race, we have to use the the other formula. Um, and so the long race formula is, is not as good. Uh, the, the other formula is, we're, we'll get to it in a minute, but the other formula is more complicated. But in general, what the, if you want to use the 10% plus two rule is that you need to uh, bump it up by two to three pips depending on, on the race. So this is actually, we would probably use the 10%, what the equivalent of a 10% rule here. Uh, the, the window is still three pips, but uh, you want to use a 10% rule here. In any case, those are the adjustments that you'd make. Um, so let's go, uh, let's see if we get, I'll go over the uh, the medium rule. And then if we get, I don't know if we'll have time, but but then we can apply the adjustments on the medium rule and we'll get a little bit better. Yeah, so here's, um, uh, the, so the the, uh, the long race rule applies to generally, it's, uh, we call that the rule of 62. Uh, if you're, the, the leader's pip count is 62 or higher. Um, if the leader's pip count is less than 62, uh, we're going to use this uh, uh, this another formula, um, and this is more complicated, but it's right here. I've highlighted it here. Um, and again, the way to learn this is to you know print out this sheet and uh, sit down and do the math on a sheet of paper while you're watching the uh, uh, while you're looking at the uh, screen uh, and have the pip counts there. So we're going to take uh, take our Keith count, subtract five and then divide by seven, and then that's going to be, we're going to add that, and that's the point of last take. So if we're at 62, we're going to subtract five, which gives us uh, 58, I'm sorry, 57, divide by that by seven, don't round, uh, which is going to be eight. Um, and we're going to add that to the 62, which is 70. And so 70 is the point of last take. Now, uh, it so happens that at 62, uh, uh, you know, if, if you write apply the rule of 10% plus 2, you come up with 70 as the point of last take. It's the same uh, number at 62, and that's why it's called the rule of 62. However, if you go down lower, what you'll find is that the the point of last take comes sooner. Basically, you're going to double sooner uh, the, the shorter the race. Um, okay, and the the uh, doubling window is the same. It's three pips. Point of last take minus three pips. Uh, oh, here's I didn't mention this. Uh, I'll mention it now. Uh, the redouble. If you're going to redouble, meaning you have the Q Q on your side, uh, you're going to be a little bit more conservative, uh, which means that the, you're going to double when the point of, it's point of last take, point of last take minus two pips instead of minus three. That's when you double. The the take point is still the same. The point of last take is still the same. Um, so, um, okay, it's eight fifty nine. So I uh, we're. So, uh, okay, I won't, um, we won't go over these. The idea is the same as for the long race, except the formula is different. 
Uh, you have to practice that to, to get it. The, the formula is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, if you don't want to use the more complicated formula, uh, I would subtract one or two pips off the 10% plus two rule um, and just you know, basically double earlier, the shorter the race. I do would, I would like to go through um, uh, one, one other way of looking at a, a short race. The short race to the, where you get to the point of uh, where you're counting rolls. And uh, what I just went over with the, the racing formulas was kind of an analytic method where you do calculations and you come up with it and it's for the long races, it's extremely accurate, a little bit less so for the short races, but but is still pretty accurate there. Uh, when you get to uh, positions where you're counting rolls, uh, which is f basically five rolls or less. Uh, the best thing is, is is not to worry about the count, but to remember what's called a reference position. So here's a reference position. Um, and the key pictures parts of them, the key things to remember about the reference position is that white is on roll and is going to come off in four moves, four rolls. Uh, Bari ignoring doubles and black is on roll is going to come off in four rolls. And so uh, this is a double and a take. Um, uh, and so you simply remember that. Uh, and, and now you're not going to rarely do you come up with exactly this position, but um, you might come up with something like this. And you can see that this is almost the same, four rolls and four rolls. Uh, this is also a double and a take. Um, now, play around a little bit more with this. If we take two chapters off, this is a three roll position. Three roll versus three roll is a double and a pass. Now, what you'll usually come up with is something odd like this, oops, where this is uh, basically a three roll position. Well, this is a three roll position, but because black has an odd checker, this is also a three roll position. Now, again, we're, and we're, we're ignoring doubles. Obviously, whoever gets a double here is gonna win. Um, the first one to get the double. And so this, um, you know, this is a pass. Uh, we can change this to a four row position. Whoops. Uh, yeah. This, there are only seven checkers, but it's still a four row position. And now we have, and this is also a four row position. Um, and so this is a double and a take. Uh, now, Uh, a lot of the more more complicated position, basic positions that aren't races, uh, are going to rely on reference position types of, of ideas. Where you uh, uh, essentially the way to learn them is to memorize a position, uh, understand its key features, uh, and then when you get into the game and you get something that's similar, you try to uh, adjust whatever your reference position is to whatever you. To remember, so you're you're either at the exact you're usually not exactly at the reference position, but you're someplace close. Uh, so here, this isn't you know eight checkers off versus eight checkers, but it's seven versus seven. That's still a full roll position. Um, Gary, okay. do you mind going off topic for a little bit? I had a uh, position emailed to me today by Doug Koth, and he had five yellow checkers on the one and black had four checkers on the two so that was the total position of four checkers on the two yeah that was it yeah and he was white and he doubled yeah and was i would great. Without setting it up, I was just trying to go through it. So I'm just. Yeah, that's the tricky one because you look, okay, 
we've got five checkers, so we're off uh, in three rolls. Uh, black has four checkers, so black could be off in two rolls unless black rolls an ace. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not double aces, but an ace. So this is where you 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 get into math. And so what are the you know, what are the chances that in the next two rolls black will roll an ace? Um, uh, and not double aces. So uh, you know there there are uh, without getting too much, th there are ten rolls, ten out of thirty six rolls uh, in which um, black could could roll an ace. Uh, and then if, if black rolls an ace, it's it's a you know it's going to be a double and a clear double and a clear pass. Um, so the way to figure that out is really to do the math to figure out your winning chances. Uh, and so you would go to figure out the chances of rolling the ace in the next two. Uh, I usually do something like, okay, it's one third. 10 out of 36 is roughly one third. You're not quite a little bit lower than that. Uh, so the chances that he'll, uh, that he'll um, not roll an ace are two thirds. Um, and so the chances that he'll not roll an ace in either of the next two is two thirds times two thirds, which is four ninths. Uh, uh, make it a little less, about forty percent of the time. So, um, you know, what I would say is that sixty percent of the time he's not going to roll an ace, and forty percent of the time he is going to roll an ace. If he rolls an ace, generally white's going to win, and black will lose. Uh, so, uh, I would not have doubled here. Let's see what it is. It's yeah. Um, so it's actually a little bit better. I, I, I had it at, at roughly, uh, 40, 60 to, to white. And it's uh, a little bit better than that. And the reason it's better than that is that if white rolls a double white wins, uh, and white is on roll and has a chance to do that. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, it's not, uh, it's not a double here. Actually, it's, it's a, it's a beaver. Um, I won't, don't want to get into what beavers are, but uh, uh, but white is still favored here. I I I would I don't know that I would have gotten that. Um, uh, in in my simple analysis, he wasn't favored. It was more like um, sixty forty. But white is favored here. So, but I would you know in this case I would say look I got three rolls. He's got two rolls uh, and, and, and maybe a third roll. And his chances of getting that third roll, um, you know, are, are you know, not that great, less than 50%. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, so I wouldn't have doubled here. I don't know if that helps, but. Uh, that's you know that's the sort of position that you get into with a reference position that okay you know this isn't four roll versus three roll uh, you know I, I think obviously if, if he had the checker here so that now this is at least three rolls without doubles that this is a clear double and a pass because this is an easier three roll versus three roll position and black actually well, yeah. black can now in order for black not to get off in three rolls, he has to double. He has to roll uh, an ace. Uh, really, three times. He rolls he rolls the ace once, then he rolls an ace again, but he takes it off, and he's got to roll it a third time. You know, going back to the other one with four checkers on the two, I was looking at winning chances, and yellow had a uh, like 54 percent winning chances yeah but i guess the question is if why if yellow doesn't roll a double and black doesn't roll a one does black recube oh uh, well and I think they would claim, wouldn't they? Oh, okay. So, so white rolls and two off. 
and black, black rolls. Makes two of them. So we get to this with and then black white rolls again because black can't with, double here. So white rolls again. So yeah. So here's one. Uh, does black double here? So black would double, but white should still take. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, a classic. Yeah, and so this gets into more a little more advanced uh, idea than what we had here, but and more towards, but it's but it's it's good for understanding what doubles are are good for. Here, there's um, you know, black is going to win the game here uh, as long as he doesn't roll an ace, so uh, a single ace, not not double aces, just a single ace. So there are ten rolls where he loses, twenty six rolls where he wins. Now, um, you know, and match scores can throw this off, but generally, uh, if you're in a money game, say, uh, you're going you're gonna to like Black's odds uh, because 16 times he wins, 10 times he loses. So that's a good deal for Black. But White is on the opposite side. Uh, uh, 16 times he loses, 10 times he wins. But that's still a take uh, because the take point for the final row position, the take point is 25%. And black has, uh, white has 27%. But more typically, white would have three on the 24 after they only get to this. Yeah, so with this position, black doubles. And white drops, huh? Yeah, yeah. This is a big drop because first of all, black has to first roll an ace for white to even have a chance to roll. Then if he does roll that ace, white's got to roll doubles. And so he's got you know six rolls out of 36 to, to roll that set of doubles. And so and he only gets those six six out of 36 chances if black rolls an ace, you know, 10 out of 36. So his chances of winning are are you know, one over six times 10 over 36. Uh, which so is what, not, is, what does XG say here? Oh, on this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so big pass. Nice. Chances are about 5%. All right. Thank you. Sorry to take you off message, but. Okay. So that that is the end of that. Any questions? I'll take. If not, thank you for coming. And um, again, I will send the uh, PowerPoint over to, uh, I forget who's going to get it, uh, April, I guess. I'll take it. Yeah, you can send it to me. I'll send it to April, and then uh, you can send it out to whoever whoever would like to have it. Thank you I'll... so much, Gary. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. This is thank a very complicated topic, and I appreciate that you're giving us a handout because I think a lot of, us would love to review this and it takes some practice at home, but it helps to be pushed in the right direction, Gary. So yeah, yeah, no, I don't think anyone can absorb all it. this and apply it, uh, you know, just based on one, you know, one session like this. Um, so yeah, take it, practice as much as you, as you can, as much as you need to, uh, you know, doing it, if you're playing online, it's a good time to practice that when you have the accounts that you can, you know, you can check um, uh, that you're doing that and, um and and good luck it, it will work thank, thank you so you much gary i'll i'll send the handout out via email so just look for that in your email inbox good night, thank you everyone. very much very informative okay have a good have a good evening